Welcome back to FISM News. I'm Samuel Case. We ha have with us today Cassandra Spencer, previously an undercover journalist with Project Veritas. She's done exposés on Facebook, Beto O'Rourke's Senate campaign, and Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign. She's also the author of her new book, Impact, How I Went Behind Enemy Lines in Our Struggle Against the Far Left. Welcome, Cassandra. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's, it's great to have you. We had a, a good time chatting with the CPAC, and uh, it's good to have you back to have another discussion. This time we're going to talk about the book a little bit, uh, as well as some of your thoughts about the media in general, and as well as a, a recent legal action I understand you've been taking that relates to Project Veritas. So let's jump in with it, with just the book at first. So the, you say on the back the book isn't a Project Veritas tell-all, as you say, but it is kind of a Cassandra tell-all, right? I'd say it's kind of an autobiography about what led up to your time with Veritas and the challenges you faced while you were working undercover. Would you say that's a correct summation? Yes, it's very much my personal story of how I ended up at Project Veritas, how I kind of feel like in some ways, um, whether it's God or something else, it was kind of what was meant to happen in my life. If I kind of look back, I, I always kind of joke that it's almost Forrest Gumpian in a way, where if I look back on my life, I see things foreshadowing what was going to happen later on, um, happened several times throughout my life. And so I decided to write this book. Um, it initially started as me journaling as something that I could give to my daughter later on down the road so she would know that during the time we were apart what her mom was up to. And then, uh, kind of things just progressed and then I decided that I felt the need to tell the story to the world. Yeah, we actually chatted about that a little bit, the the foreshadowing because what well, your first breaking story was uh about Facebook and uh at the time your your daughter was living in Farmville, correct? So there's kind of a funny parallel yes. there too. Uh and yes. and one of the driving forces in it uh, it's on the back of the book and one of the the big phrases that you promote the book with is you're asked was it worth it? You blew the whistle on Facebook, you faced a bunch of backlash from it, and you said, without a doubt, yes. Uh, what made it worth it for you? And if you could tell a little bit of that story, too, um, of your experience with Facebook and what the fallout of that looked like. So when I was working at Facebook, it was shortly after I was getting out of the Army, and you know, I was trying to get my civilian career off the ground. I thought that this was a great way, you know, I, it was a contract position at Facebook, but I was like, this is awesome. I'm going to get my foot in the door. Like we're going to start our civilian career. This is going to be great. And so, you know, pretty quickly, I would say within a matter of a month to two months, I started noticing things at the company that were clearly not right going on. And so that was when I started digging into it deeper and I just found more and more and more. Um, and being a military officer, you know, I've always felt a very strong sense of justice, of the need to do the right thing. And so I was like, okay, well, either you can say nothing and just keep your job and be comfortable and, you know, likely end up eventually with a full-time position at Facebook, or you can go the other route, do the right thing and know that this could blow up in your face, which in many ways it did. Um, I was escorted out by Facebook security, locked in a room for two hours and interrogated, uh, ended up unemployed, ended up on food stamps for the first time in my life, even though I had been a single mother since college. Um, so it, it was a lot to sacrifice. But when I see not only what I exposed at Facebook, but the ripple effect that it had to get other people to come forward from other tech companies, whether it be Google, Pinterest, um, other Facebook insiders, CNN. When I see the ripple effect that that had, there is no doubt in my mind that I made the right choice. Yeah, and, and you're going to pay something either way if you either lose your job or you pay with your integrity, right? Because um, that, that's one of the big takeaways I got from the book. You hear conservatives a lot saying, how can I stand up for the truth and not lose anything? How do I say something to my boss or my professor and not get a bad grade or get kicked out of my job, what have you? And, and the through line in this book is that you are going to have to pay something. It's just a question of what it will be. So what would you have to say, Cassandra, to someone who does need to speak up, say at the workplace, or even be a whistleblower, whistleblower excuse me, or they're just someone at school who has a leftist professor and they need to say something, what would your encouragement be for them and what words of advice would you have? 
Now, everyone's situation is highly, you know, dependent and every situation is different. I don't want to say that one piece of advice is blanket and works for everybody because sometimes you're in a system that can be reformed from the inside. However, a lot of these days, a lot of these institutions, whether it be institutions, educational or government, they are so far so woke. Like we look at the CIA ads recently. I would love to see a CIA whistleblower come out because at the end of the day, um, you have to just decide to do the right thing. And there will be people out there to support you, whether it's Project Veritas, whether it's just the public in general. I've received so much support from people, whether it be from my former employer, Project Veritas, or whether it be from just people, you know, who come up to me on the street, um, you know, now that I've shared my story and it, it is so worth it. There is a whole community of people because we really are the silent majority. Um, we cannot let 10% of people who like to bully people on Twitter dictate the direction of this country. Yeah. And, but you, you do acknowledge in the book that it can be discouraging uh, at times, right? Because big tech, as you acknowledge at the end, is, seems stronger than ever. The left's on the rise. We have Biden in office. Everything is going woke, as you just said. Uh, but you still see that you had an impact and you're encouraging others to, to come out and be part of that as well. What do you see your impact is in 2021 now in the aftermath, even though it does appear that the opponents of liberty are on the rise? Right. And it's just like any, you know, like I said, my background is as a military officer and there's going to be times where it seems like you're on the ropes, but there's something somewhat liberating in that. Once you decide that you are going to take a stand and that you're willing to lose your comfort, you know, be willing to possibly be defamed by the media there, then you become someone who they can no longer control. And there is freedom in that. So that's kind of where I stand on it is it's actually very freeing. And even though, yes, things do seem dark right now for me personally, I know that I'm going to continue to fight, continue to move forward because at this point it's like, what are these people going to take from me? Like I've, I've had everything taken from me at some point or another, I could lose it all again and I'm not afraid. And speaking of the media, I do have a, a question. I asked this to Christian Hartstock at Project Veritas, and I'm curious about your take with this. In the book, you're doing some real journalism. You're going undercover and you're seeing, you're digging around, seeing what's going on at these various campaigns uh, and exposing some untoward, uh, sometimes illegal behavior, not just unethical. And that's what journalism used to be. It used to be going after the powerful, but now journalism and the media are just protecting the powerful. Where do you think that change happened? And do you think that uh, we can go back to the way it used to be? You know, I think there's a certain uh, tendency to romanticize journalism in the past and say that, like, at some point we ever had truly objective journalism. I think that's a little bit um, of a, a, a fallacy. I don't I don't think that's exactly true. However, I do feel that if you even look at like Upton Sinclair, he was a socialist and he exposed great things when he went undercover. He did. He have an agenda. Absolutely. But there was never any doubt about his agenda. The problem that we have now is that you have these um, journalistic organizations like CNN or The New York Times who feign objectiveness, but they're not. They're not at all. And I think that's what's really toxic is when you have somebody who pretends that they don't have an angle and they pretend like they're giving you the straight truth without any sort of opinion and they're not. And that's the issue is because even though I may have a personal opinion, everything that I reported as a journalist was objective fact. Um, you could see the person's mouth moving. You could see, you know, there's documents, there's things like that, things that I cannot control. Um, now I can give my personal opinion, but I keep that separate from what I'm actually reporting. And it, it's interesting you mentioned Christian Hartsock because he and I worked together on many stories and yeah, absolutely. Um, great journalist, great journalist. So, so you would be of the school of thought that uh, papers and media outlets need to just own the perspective that they come from, but then with that in mind, be public, oh, I'm a Republican paper, I'm a Democrat paper, but then still try to get at the truth. That should be, that'd be the most ideal way of doing things. Yes, I don't think there's anything wrong with having an opinion, but what matters is 
is what you are reporting an objective fact. And when it comes to things like, you know, we've seen with some of the ballot harvesting stories, these are things that are actually going on. When we see crimes that are being committed, these are actually happening. You can see them happening on camera. And so that is an objective truth. That is not opinion. Um, for instance, I had a story where a man admitted to voting in both New Hampshire and Florida, and that's just a fact. He, he double voted, which is a felony. And so whether I had an opinion about it one way or the other, whether I was trying to make a point doesn't matter. All that matters is whether the information that I reported is true or not. Very good. That's the, that's the way it should be, I would think. But speaking of journalism going off the rails and journalists having more of an agenda than beyond just their basic bias to playing gotcha journalism, uh, you and Project Veritas are taking legal action against a freelance journalist named Jesse Hicks, who writes for the Daily Beast and the New Republic. Can you tell us a little, about, a little bit about this case and how it involves you and what the background is of that case? So last summer, um, and this is actually one of the things that inspired me to publish Impact, um, I had left Project Veritas earlier in 2020. I didn't really think much of it. I was trying to move on with my life here in Texas, uh, move on to the next thing. All of a sudden, one day, I get a phone call from a journalist. Uh, he informs me that his name is Jesse Hicks, and he is asking me if he can talk to me about my involvement in the 2020 election. And uh, I'm like, what are you? First of all, I don't even know what this guy's talking about. Secondly, I have no desire to talk to him. So I'm like, please do not contact me. And I hang up the phone. Um, from then on, things start to get weird. So not only does this guy make multiple phone numbers to call me on, um, despite me asking him not to contact me again, um, he then starts to impersonate Project Veritas staff uh, in an effort to get me to talk to to these pretend Project Veritas people, including pretending to be my immediate supervisor. Um, and we have all of this documented uh, in the legal action that we filed. Um, and then he proceeded to stalk me outside my home for months. Uh, it followed me even after I moved to another town here in Texas. And he even went so far as to start contacting people outside in my personal life who literally had nothing to do with Project Veritas to the point where they didn't know what Project Veritas was until I told them. <laughs> so yeah. uh, it was very excessive. And like I said, this went on for months, you know, and of course, when it's one thing to say like, oh, you're paranoid, but it's not paranoia when they're actually doing it. That's right. You know what I mean? That's right. So it, I'm not you actually paranoid have, you actually when have the photo the guy evidence. sitting outside my house. Right. Like there's literally, so at one point I had, you know, gone on a date with someone from Tinder because I'm, you know, young and single. Right. And so my Tinder date comes over to pick me up and he's like, after he leaves, he's like, oh, you know, uh, next time I come over to your house, I think I need to find somewhere else to park. Now, mind you, at the time I did not live in an apartment complex or anywhere with reserved parking. So I'm kind of like looking at him like, what do you mean? There's just street parking. He's like, yeah, someone's giving me a dirty look uh, when I left your house. And so weeks later, he informs me that Jesse Hicks had contacted him via Twitter and sent him these photos, which, you know, are also included in the legal action we filed. So these photos of both him and I, and there's no way either one of us could have taken these photographs. And they're like, we know, you know, Cassandra Spencer, you know, we'd like to ask you some questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this dude, understandably, completely freaked out. You know, he has kids. He's like, I don't know what kind of weird stuff you're involved in. I don't know if these people are dangerous. Like, I can't be doing this. And, you know, understandably, I said that's probably the best reason that anyone's ever had to break up with me. So, uh. <laughs> well, well I, we pray that that uh, court case goes well and we'll be sure to keep up to date. You know, if he wanted to know more about you, he should have just bought the book. I think that would have turned out a lot better for him <laughs> and for you because you had another person that bought your book. Uh, thank you so much, Cassandra, for coming on again. This is Cassandra Spencer, former undercover journalist for Project Veritas and author of Impact, How I Went Behind Enemy Lines in Our Struggle Against the Far Left. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sam.